For the United States, armed drones have become the weapon of choice for the war on terror. But do drone strikes offer a compelling option, or do the controversy they generate outweigh the benefit? Since 9-11, the U.S. has been carrying out drone strikes that have killed suspected al-Qaeda members, as well as civilians in a number of countries, all without congressional authorization. Here in Pakistan, the remote tribal areas have been subject to the largest drone campaign to date. But one Pakistani attorney has been fighting back. Shahzad Akbar is a human rights lawyer who is representing drone victims in a criminal case against U.S. officials. He's a director and founder of Foundation of Fundamental Rights and a Pakistan fellow for the British human rights organization Reprieve. He joins me now to discuss the U.S. drone war, its implications in Pakistan, the United States and across the world. Sir, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. How would you describe the fundamental issue with the U.S. drone program uh, as you see it? First of all, the fundamental problem with drone strikes in Pakistan is that it's completely negating the right to life of citizens of Pakistan. And, it, and that's the, the basis of our whole campaign against drones. Uh, the, the other issues like uh, violation of sovereignty or not having proper um, a legal mechanism behind uh, the drone strikes in Pakistan. That's all, to, for me, it's all subsidiary or all subsidiary issues. The main issue here is that it's negating the right to life to people of Pakistan. It's negating due process. It's negating everything which a civilized society offers, a democratic society offers to its citizens. So it's against the law. And this is, and this is taking um, lives, and it's not just taking uh, militant or terrorist lives is taking civilians, young children, women, elderly, and other civilians' lives as well. But the drone program has been touted as a more humane form of warfare. In fact, some of its supporters have said that it's more preferable to have, for instance, a few precision strikes as opposed to soldiers, boots on the ground, fighting a traditional war. I think when uh, President Obama tells people that drones are more humane uh, weapons, I think he's just trying to be a good salesman for a weapon. End of the day, it's a weapon which kills. So if you kill people in a humane way or inhumane way, the basic fundamental thing which you're doing here is killing. And if that killing is illegal without the due process, then that's what's wrong with it. It's not about the weapon, it's not about that machinery, it's about the the, the very thing what you do and that is killing. So if you're killing people without due process, without any law behind you, then you're committing a crime. U.S. President Barack Obama has said that these drone strikes do not result in a large number of civilian casualties. He's in fact said that these are precise uh, attacks that target al-Qaeda and their affiliates. And he's also said that the program targets active terrorists. Uh, what do you make of the U.S. President's assessment of the drone program? President Obama often says that it only kills militants and doesn't kill civilians, but yet he fails to give names and identities of those who have been killed in these strikes in Pakistan. Now, according to independent sources, more than 3,000 people have been killed in uh, Waziristan uh, in Pakistan, but not a single name has been given uh, by President Obama or the CIA, which is carrying out these strikes. What we hear from news reports is just a few names of militant leaders who have been killed, and the rest is all ghosts. So if President Obama is so sure that he is killing militants and he has not killed any civilian, then he is to give the names and details of all those militants who he has killed. Because for as a Pakistani, I would be happy, in a sense, that if you have killed all those people who are creating all this... Uh, terror in my cities, if you've killed all these people, okay, I'll let you go probably for your violation of law, but at least I will be happy that you're making me safe. But the question here is that who are you killing? You have no idea yourself, and this is what the recent reports published in American media said tells us, that U.S. has no idea, CIA has no, CIA has no idea who they are actually killing in these drone strikes. But how do we know who's actually being targeted and who's actually being killed? I mean, isn't this the CIA who should be knowing who they're killing? Because CIA, when they say it's very precise and it's very accurate, so what is that precision and accuracy if you do not know who you're killing? Most of the drone strikes take place in remote tribal areas that are effectively blocked off by the Pakistan government to the outside world. Uh, can you describe what the conditions are like in these areas? 
Well, uh, most of the drone strikes in Pakistan, which the number total number is more than 370 drone strikes so far, and they have been taking place in the tribal areas of Pakistan, and specifically in two agencies. One is South Waziristan, and second is North Waziristan. And these areas, one is an operational military area, and the other area has a huge contingent of Pakistani military in that area, uh, which has been blocked from rest of the country. The whole border between Pakistan uh, from North Waziristan to Afghanistan is also pretty much manned. Uh, according to the recent number which they have given to a UN representative in Pakistan, that number is more than 100,000 soldiers in Waziristan. So this is the kind of area where when President Obama says that this is a place I'm hitting where Pakistani army or no one can reach. So there is a reach, but that reach is of Pakistani military and no one else. So for example, independent journalists like you or a campaigner like me or a lawyer like me cannot go to that area. And similarly, if anyone wants to come out of that area to report of any violation, it's extremely difficult for that person to come here because uh, just to give you an example, to get out of Miransha, which is the capital of North Waziristan, um, to get out of that into a settled area, there's a road which is not more than 30 to 40 kilometers, and you have to cross seven military checkpoints, where pretty much at every checkpoint you are stripped and strip searched. And if you do not have an ID showing that you are from that tribal area, you are not allowed in or out. Some people might not like it, but I'd simply call it a concentration camp, that you have built a wall of uh, military and militants, and behind that wall you're keeping more than 800,000 people who are not allowed to come out, and no one from the rest of the country is allowed to go in. And that's the kind of laboratory which U.S. is using to use and test its drone program. But how do you establish the innocence of your clients? Uh, a skeptical person might wonder whether you could, in fact, be representing militants. Interestingly, I don't have to prove their innocence in a court of law, because in court of law, you have this principle that presumption of innocence. Everyone is innocent till proven guilty. It's just the court of public perception when I go out there with my clients. First question people ask me, how would you prove them to be innocent? And my answer to them is that, how do you prove them to be guilty so that you kill them? Do you have anything against my clients to say that, no, they are militants, they are family members of militants, so the person who has been killed was militant, so therefore that person was killed? There is not even the allegation of that uh, present here. And how would we define a militant in this case? I mean, uh, I've read statements that say that the United States uh, claims any able-bodied male from a certain age group is potentially a militant. I think there are two things here. One is that, first of all, there is no definition of who is a militant and who is not a militant, just like there's no definition so far of a terrorist. The, we don't have so far a proper definition of terrorist. Similarly, but the problem here is in Waziristan that what we're talking about here is the signature strikes. Now, this is kind of a methodology which has been developed by CIA that they're going to study the behavior pattern and the way someone is dressed or is, is looking like. And then on basis of that, they draw this assumption that this person might be a militant we're looking for. And that just this whole process simply explains to you the absurdity of this process in selecting a target. So for example, according to, again, once again, the documents leaked by CIA or of CIA and uh, printed and published in American journals or newspapers indicate that a signature strike is where a CIA operative looking at the screen studies the pattern and behavior. So for example, if there's a guy who has long beard, wears a certain kind of turban, carries a gun, drives in an SUV, is your militant. And this is the basis of CIA labeling anyone as militant and then taking a target and killing them. And this is what we used to have in the United States in 60s, racial profiling. If you're a black guy and you are walking in a white neighborhood, in odd hour, police were supposed to stop and search you because you're a black guy, you're supposed to be a thief. So the question for Americans is that, is this what you would like to be known for? 
or are your principles important which your forefathers fought for centuries and they build those pr principles within your own country. The U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense recently told the Senate Armed Services Committee that uh, there is no geographical or time boundary to the drone war. In fact, he said that the drone strikes are likely to continue far beyond uh, President Obama's term uh, in the White House, uh, possibly as far as until 2024 or even 2034. What is your reaction to that? I think a U.S. administration is not really listening to reason here because all governments around the world, uh, UN, uh, people on ground are telling them that this is a disastrous program and you have to listen to reason, you have to listen to all those hundreds of cases of civilian innocent who have been killed in Pakistan and Waziristan by drones and hundreds of civilians who have been killed even in Afghanistan where your forces even have the ground control and still you are committing so many mistakes there and killing civilians. Uh, just to give you one example, in 2010, uh, U.S. Uh, military killed its own soldiers on ground with a drone who were dressed, so there were American soldiers who were dressed as local locals on some kind of operation and they've been killed by drones themselves. And one thing which American administration needs to understand that drone technology is not a very sophisticated or complicated technology. And what if in future other countries uh, have drone, what would be the impact of the precedence which U.S. is setting on the world. Well, you sort of make it seem uh, like there is unanimous international opposition to the drone program, but if drones uh, per se were so bad, why would Pakistani officials ask for the technology? I would ask the question that what role Pakistani army or Pakistani government is playing in drone wars, because on one side they're saying that drones are illegal and counterproductive, but on the other side we also hear that they have been cooperating on drone wars in Pakistan. And this is the key question which we've been asking through our litigation. And this is the thing which has been settled in Peshawar High Court litigation, which we recently succeeded in. And the court held categorically that there has, they, drone strikes are illegal, and Pakistani government finally submitted their reply in the court saying that they are not cooperating and they will not cooperate in future and there is no consent on drone strikes. So therefore the court gave very categorical order to the government of Pakistan to tell Americans that there will be no more drone strikes in Pakistan and if there are there will be consequences for our rulers as well. And what are the prospects for this? I think there, there are good prospects. I think this judgment of Peshawar High Court provides that tool to Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif to take up the case of drones with the Americans and settle it. Now it's for the Americans to listen to reason. And if they don't, then I'm not sure that what options Prime Minister is left with because we've had a Prime Minister in recent past who has been sent home by a court of law but for not uh, abiding by the decision of the court. So then uh, Prime Minister Sharif will be running the risk of being sent home. This is exactly what we'll be doing if the drone strikes continue and Prime Minister doesn't do much on drones. He doesn't uh, tell the Americans to stop it. He doesn't order the Pakistani military to shoot it down. Uh, then we have no other option but to go to court for contempt of court against him. Shazad Akbar, human rights attorney here in Islamabad. Thank you so much for speaking with RT.